So it's a new word. He just made it up. There was no word to describe it. And I think it is a marvelous word. At one minute. Let's start from the beginning. Luke chapter 24, verse 17. Two people are walking on the way to Emmaus, and suddenly a third man is walking with them, and they are so depressed and so dejected. And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? Don't you know what has happened? They were so dejected. They just lost their entire hope. They had been expecting the kingdom to come, and now their Messiah was dead. And then it says in verse 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, I would have loved to have listened to that Bible study. Wouldn't you have liked to listen to that? That must have been the most awesome Bible study ever given. And uh, I cannot even imagine what it was all about except perhaps to think a little bit about it. Luke chapter 24, verse 32, And they said one to another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? Now, we only have glimpses, glimpses today, and we can see a little here, and we can see a little there. But I wonder what he said to them. He started with Moses, and he went through the scriptures. Now, we don't have time to do all of that. Acts chapter 7, verse 37 says, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear. And then a second verse in John 3, 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So there's a typological connection between Moses and Jesus. And Jesus must have pointed this out. A prophet like unto me. So if we think about that a little bit, and you think about Moses, when Moses was born, there was a decree to have all the little boys killed. And there was a similar decree in the time when Jesus was born because Herod wanted to destroy this king that was going to come. And so both of them had a very similar beginning. Uh, Moses was preserved and Jesus was preserved by divine intervention. Moses was the deliverer of the children of Israel from the physical bondage and slavery of Egypt. And Jesus became the deliverer from the spiritual bondage of Egypt. It's interesting that Moses performed many marvelous miracles, parting the Red Sea and all the miracles that were associated with him. And Jesus' ministry was associated with miracles. It's also fascinating that Moses had direct contact with God. He spoke to God face to face, and he was taken up into the cloud. And so Jesus also had face to face contact with God. The face of Moses shone, and the whole of Jesus shone at the transfiguration. There are so many parallels between the two that if you study it, then you can see that this is a type. Moses is a type of what would happen to Jesus. Moses was rejected by the people. And they said, as to this Moses, we what not what become of him. And they chose for themselves leaders to take them back to Egypt. And exactly the same happened to Jesus. His own people rejected him. 
And uh, the parallels are just amazing. And then Moses lifted up the serpent. And in the same way, Jesus had to be lifted up because he became sin for us. Therefore, the serpent as a symbol of Christ becoming sin for us. He who had no sin bore our sin. So there are these marvelous parallels, and he must have shown them in the life of Moses exactly uh, what the parallels were. And then he must have stopped at Abraham as well. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And here are father and son. And I like it when the Bible says, here I am. So there was this communication and this willingness to obey. And you have this beautiful typology of Abraham and his son Isaac, where Abraham is enacting the part of God the Father and Isaac the part of God the Son. And the wood is laid upon his shoulders and he carries us up this lonely hill, which is the exact same hill where Jesus was crucified. And the typology is enacted and the faith that is embodied in it because they said, we are going and we are coming back again. So he must have believed, because the promise was that through Isaac his seed would be propagated, then he must have believed that there would be a resurrection. So you have all this beautiful typology in there. And uh, God intervened, of course, and they slaughtered an animal in the place of the real thing. And then they passed by Midianites in Genesis chapter 37, verse 28, the story of Joseph, and he must have passed through Joseph's history as well. Merchant men, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. And here was a great deliverance, and he must have passed through that typology as well. And in Genesis 45, verse 7, it says, And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. There are so many parallels between the life of Joseph as a type of Christ and the life of Jesus. He was also sold for 30 pieces of silver, Jesus. He was also placed in a dungeon in a prison even though he had no fault in him. He was also hated by his brethren. The parallels are just too beautiful, and yet God used these circumstances to bring about a great deliverance. And not only that, but to change the characters of the ones involved. If you think about Judah, who said, let's sell him. Let's sell him. And at the end, Judah saying that he would be a ransom for the younger brother. Take me in his stead. How his character developed into a Christ-like character. Isaiah 53 verse 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And the scripture was fulfilled, it says in Mark 15, 28, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He must have passed through all of these typological stories, and time doesn't allow us to go to all the other prophets, how they typified Jesus Christ, or even how David typified Jesus Christ. It must have been a marvelous Bible study, and the Bible suddenly became alive, and they saw all these types and shadows and realized what they had missed. They had totally misunderstood. And the sad part is that in the times that we are living in, people misunderstand as well. In fact, the great majority of mankind totally misses the point of the atonement. Why was he numbered 
amongst the transgressors? Why did he bear the sins of many? How did he do intercession for the transgressors? You see, God had a standard and a norm, and he said that if you transgress, then the wages, the consequence, is death. That's God's justice. Justice demands the death of the transgressor. Grace demands the forgiveness of the transgressor. And the devil had been cast out of heaven, and God was in a dilemma. Because the devil accused him and said to him, you say you are a God of grace? Then you have to forgive me. You cannot apply justice and grace at the same time. The two are mutually exclusive. Either the one or the other. If you are a God of justice, then let justice prevail. If you are a God of grace, then let grace prevail. But you cannot be both. You cannot have justice and grace at the same time. They are mutually exclusive. Except, of course, if you're as brilliant as God and you come up with a solution such as this, which we must talk about. And then he must have dealt with some of the very direct prophecies. Daniel 9.25, And now therefore understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. I don't want to go into great detail with this prophecy, but it is a fantastic prophecy. And the reformers all applied a principle known as the day-year principle, where you take a prophetic day and apply it as if it were a physical, literal year. And if you count those weeks as days, then altogether in this prophecy there are 490 days. But there's a very specific period unto the Messiah, the Prince, from the commandment that the Jerusalem should be rebuilt, from that decree, there would be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And uh, that works out to 69 weeks. And if you multiply that by seven to get the days, then you have 483 years from the going forth of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Jerusalem lay in ruins, and there were three decrees that dealt with Jerusalem, but only one dealt with the total restoration of Jerusalem as a state, and that was the decree by Artaxerxes in 457 BC. You add those years to it, and you get to AD 27, which was the exact year when Jesus was baptized or anointed for the messianic ministry. So the prophecy is fulfilled to the letter. And then the final week is also explained. And in the middle of that week, the last seven years, he puts an end to the sacrificial system. In other words, he took the place of the sacrificial system. And then there was still a short time of probation, and then the gospel went to the Gentiles. A magnificent prophecy. And even an atheist like myself will have his cage rattled when he starts studying prophecies such as these and some of the others. And he must have dealt with a ceremonial law, and Jesus must have explained to them what happened in their types and ceremonies and how these types and ceremonies pointed to his mission. Because Colossians 2.17 tells us that they are a shadow of things to come, but the body, the substance, is of Christ. So this Bible study must have astounded them. The scales must have dropped off their eyes, and they must have said, how could we ever have missed it? How is it possible that we missed it? Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, please note these words carefully, 
because these issues are very important in the current debate and the unification of Christendom. So you were reconciled to God by what? By the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now have received the atonement, this beautiful word that didn't exist, that had to be described. And it is katalegai, and it means exchange, restoration, atonement. And one of the possibilities is reconciliation. And some of the modern translations, instead of atonement, use the word reconciliation, like the NIV. Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. But reconciliation is just a subparticle of the depth of the meaning of that word. It doesn't take the whole thing and put it into perspective. Atonement is a lot deeper than reconciliation. The New World Encyclopedia tells us atonement means that two parties estranged from each other because one of them offends the other eventually reconciled to each other, it usually contains two stages. The offender's act of expiation for forgiveness and from the offended party and to reconciliation, which is a regained state of unity thereafter. Whereas if you just say that two parties are reconciled, it's not absolutely clear who the offending party is. They could both just have drifted apart and come together again. But in the atonement, there is one offending party that has to have a repentance, and then there is a reconciliation. So it's a little bit deeper. And as we said, William Tyndall coined this word, atonement, at one mint to be one together, to be confederate again. And the whole gospel hinges on this word, atonement. Therefore, being justified by faith, we've dealt with that in great detail, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now let's unpack that grammatically. And uh, there are various uh, sources that you can look up to see whether this is so. Here Paul uses a perfect passive verb to describe a completed justification. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The perfect passive in Greek denotes a past event with an abiding result. So it is a decree. It is something that is established at one moment. So we find the same in Romans chapter 3, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, or we could use the word ransom there. So you have this idea of a ransom having been found. Verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. These are such nice words. They, they roll off the tongue. And the Greek there is hilasterion, and then very importantly, through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. This is Reformed theology because it is biblical theology. It takes this absolutely literally. 
Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. So you have all these beautiful words describing what God has done. And most people today just read over them. And uh, they have a problem with some of them because they might, you know, not fully understand what this means. It's just another difficult word. So what does it really mean? And why do you have this propitiation through faith in his blood? So let's look at this word propitiation. It means the turning away of wrath. Now what source am I using here? I'm using Ryrie, which is a very good source. Basic Theology, Systematic Guide to Understanding Biblical Truth. And he says, propitiation means the turning away of wrath by an offering in relation to soteriology. Now that fancy word just simply means the science of salvation, how we are saved. Propitiation means placating or satisfying the wrath of God by the atoning sacrifice of Christ. That's what it means. So there is wrath. Now, we mustn't understand wrath like we understand wrath. If someone crosses you, you might be wrathful. This is not God's wrath. God's wrath is not like our wrath. The one party has offended, it has transgressed, and justice demands the death penalty for that transgression. That's justice. But now, that is equated with the wrath. That's the dilemma of God. His justice demands it. And now his grace comes into play. And instead of forgiving the sin without any further ado, that would be contrary to justice. He finds a solution to let justice take its, take its course. A death penalty must be enacted, but it is enacted in God. Now, why can God do it and nobody else can do it? Why can no angel do it? You see, when Adam sinned, we were all in Adam. When Adam lost his innocence, all his posterity had the same basic features as Adam had. Adam couldn't pass on to his posterity what was not his to pass on. He didn't have a sinless nature anymore. He had a sinful nature. He had a sinful propensity and his offspring inherited it. But Adam was in Christ before he was Adam. So only the second Adam who incorporated the whole of humanity within himself because he was God and because he had life within himself could lay it down and take it up again and give it to whomsoever he pleases. Only God himself could perform this act and do justice to the law's requirement and at the same time prove that he's gracious and that justice and grace or mercy could kiss each other at the cross. So propitiation, or this hilasterion, is a neuter, an expiatory, uh, that is an atoning victim, and it also is the word that is used for the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, which is called the mercy seat. This is an amazing word. It is used for the mercy seat that you find in the ark on the temple. And it must have a tremendous meaning. Now, if you look at that mercy seat, it was made of pure gold. And two cherubs covered this ark. And inside this ark, there were the Ten Commandments, hewn in stone, two tablets of stone. Then there was the pot of hidden manna, we'll come to that later, and Aaron's staff that had blossomed. And this mercy seat made of pure gold represents something. We'll talk about it in a moment. So it's the same word. 
Now, Martin Luther maintained that the truth justification that we spoke about yesterday was the difference between a standing and a falling church. If a church upholds the truth of justification by faith alone, then Luther's judgment, it was a standing church. If they did not, then it was a falling church. The importance of the truth of justification by faith alone is also evidenced in the fact that the two creeds which arose out of the Reformation, the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism, maintain and defend this truth, and they do so in a precise, powerful, and comforting way. Now, we dealt with that in the lecture yesterday. So we dealt with the justification issue where Rome has a totally different view to what the Reformers had. But what about the atonement? Is that also different? Let's just look what the Heidelberg Catechism had to say on the question of how are thou righteous before God? Answer. Only by virtue, by a true faith in Jesus Christ. So that, though my conscience accuse me, and must listen carefully, that I have grossly transgressed all the commandments of God and kept none of them, and am still inclined to all evil, notwithstanding God without any merit of mine, but only of mere grace, grants and imputes to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness and holiness of Christ. Even so, as if I never had nor committed any sin, yea, as if I had fully accomplished all that obedience, which Christ has accomplished for me, inasmuch as I embrace such benefit with a believing heart. Now, in terms of justification, this is absolutely true, because this is a judicial act, and this is how it is enacted. So what they are saying here is absolutely in harmony with what the scriptural verses have to say. In contrast, how do other religions see this satisfaction. We've read now that it is through the death of Christ and the blood of Christ that atonement is made. Now, if you go and look at what uh, the other non-Christian religions believe, let's look at them. Let's have a look at Islam. What does that have to say? Islam says the following. Since God is almighty... He doesn't need the charade concocted by Christians in order to forgive man. In the Quran, God says we are all created in a state of goodness. What does the Bible say? The exact opposite, right? I was conceived in iniquity. He has not burdened man with any original sin, having forgiven Adam and Eve as he forgave us as we are all personally responsible for our actions. There is no need for a humanly concocted savior in Islam. Salvation comes from God alone. All right, so here you have grace, but you do not have justice. There's a problem there. Let's see what else they say. They quote the Quran. So the matter of Jesus as savior of mankind is refuted in the Quran, the Quran says, He has stamped them with their disbelief for their saying, We killed God's messenger, Christ Jesus, the son of Mary. They neither killed nor crucified him, even though it seemed so to them. So the Quran teaches that it was a charade. It was, a, you know, like a magician. <laughs> it didn't really happen. It just looked like it. It didn't happen. So, what's the role of Jesus in the Quran? Christ, the son of Mary, was no more than a messenger. Many were the messengers that passed away before him. See how God does make his signs clear to them, yet see in what ways they are deluded away from the truth. That's Zura 5, 75. So, he's just a normal messenger according to the Quran. Who can be better in religion than one who submits his whole self to God, does good and follows the way of Abraham, the true in faith? So he's saying, do good. 
O oh, people of the book, commit no excesses in your religion, nor say of God aught but the truth. Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, was no more than a messenger of God, for God is one God, glory be to him. Far exalted is he above having a son. To him belong all things in the heavens and on the earth, and enough is God as a disposer of affairs. You don't need, you don't need a son for an atonement. So if you take the Quran with the Arabic text, the transliteration, the one that they hand out in the United Nations, it says here in these four words of the Quran, the end of Christ in the Bible and the Quran. But the Quran says Christ was altogether saved from the indignity of the cross, and as, as if by a miracle of likeness someone else of the same feature was crucified by the Jews under illusion says the Quran. While the Jews claim to have killed Christ on the cross, it is also a cardinal point of faith to the Orthodox Christian churches that Jesus Christ gave up his life on the cross. He was buried after crucifixion. On the third day he rose in body with his wounds fresh, and he met his disciples and was afterwards taken up bodily into heaven. In fact, this is the belief which forms the basis of the theological doctrine of blood sacrifice and vicarious atonement for sin, which is, however, losing its force with the modern age, an age of action and retribution. So the atonement is completely denied in the Quran. Didn't happen. Never happened. In fact, they go so far as to say God is indignant if Christ is believed to be God himself. To say nothing of Godship, Christ is not even the Son of God, but only an apostle like several others. It is to be accepted that Islam is the religion of truth and Muhammad is the apostle of God, says the Quran. So Islam denies the atonement. What about Buddhism? Here's the New World Encyclopedia. Buddhism is far from theistic. Well, there's no personal God in Buddhism. None whatsoever. No personal communication. Everything has to come from self. So it has no real concept of atonement with God. It rather focuses on atonement with fellow humans, teaching the importance of forgiveness. Even if you are offended by someone who commits sin against you, you are supposed to forgive him. So atonement is initiated more by the offended party than by the offender. You are supposed to practice metta, which is loving kindness, or karuna, which is compassion, and mudita, which is sympathetic joy. But the whole idea of forgiveness comes from the belief that it prevents both the offended and the offender from developing neg negative and harmful emotions from the karma that unfortunately binds them in sin and misery. So there is no atonement. It's not possible because there is no personal God, so how can there be an atonement? So the great religions of the world do not accept the biblical teaching. Now what about the largest group in Christianity, Catholicism? What do they do? We constantly see the crucifix, we see them making the sign of the cross. They celebrate the mass, which is the sacrifice and all of these things. Surely they have a concept of the atonement? Well, what about this group over here? This is an image that was traced back to 2011 in a San Francisco walk for life where these uh, people said, Mary, if Mary had had an abortion, we wouldn't be in this mess. Interesting. 1 Corinthians 1.23, but in spite of what these people say and what the other religions say, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. You see, people don't like this doctrine. It's not a comfortable doctrine doctrine. Let's have a look at the Catholic view of atonement. At the Council of Trent, the declaration of which are still in force, the Roman Catholic Church formally condemned 
the biblical doctrine of faith alone. That was justification. That was in the previous lecture. I just want to remind you of that. If anyone says that justifying faith is nothing else than confidence in divine mercy, which remits sins for Christ's sake, or that it is this confidence alone that justifies him, let him be an anathema. So they don't agree with justification. That it is Christ who imputes us with his righteousness. It is not any righteousness that belongs to me, but it is outside of myself. If anyone says that justice received is not preserved and also not increased before God through good works, but that those works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not the cause of its increase, let him be an anathema. So just like Islam, we have the same doctrine here. It is through your works that you are judged. Whereas the biblical doctrine is, is through the works of Christ and his justice and his character that is imputed to me that I stand sinless before God. So it's not me, it's him. That's the one point. But Catholics have another view of the atonement as well. And here's a web page, a Catholic web page, which puts it quite interestingly. And it says here is the Reformed view, Protestantism, where you have God the Father, and you have wrath of God, and then you have the Son being punished for the sins of the people. And as Professor Crossham said it, well, in that case, we must love the Son, but we should hate the Father. I don't think he has any concept when he says that of the idea that the Father and the Son are one and that they are both involved in this. And if you've seen Jesus, then you've seen the Father. So this is a divine decision that was taken and not one entity clobbering another one for someone else's fault, but a divine decision taken in its totality. So that is kind of weird to break this down to that. So they say, well, we have God the Father, this is the Catholic view, and you have self-sacrificing love, which led to the cross. But the cross wasn't necessary. And this is where the crux of the matter comes in. You see, let's see the Catholic view. Let's get some sources to make, them, make it plain. Explain it to us, please. What do you believe? Alan Jones, the reverend at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, wrote a book called Reimagining Christianity. And here he states the Catholic view. The church's fixation on the death of Jesus as a universal saving act must end. And the place of the cross must be reimagined in Christian faith. Why? Because of the cult of suffering and the vindictive God behind it. That's exactly what Crossham said. We should hate the Father, but we should love the Son, right? Of the atonement, John also said, Jones also says, Jesus' sacrifice was to appease an angry God. Penal substitution was the name of this vile doctrine. Okay, so Catholicism doesn't believe that it was necessary for Jesus to die. Uh, let's just make sure, right? We want to be sure. We want to be sure. So let's listen to what Richard Leonard, and he's a Sydney-based Jesuit priest, who is also the director of the Australian Catholic Film Office, and he states on the atonement the following. Most of the radio interview titled, What to Say to Suffering and Death, was interesting, but I found Richard's comments on atonement, particularly so, in the top 10 hymns for Christians right throughout the world, he said, I think how great thou art gets into the top five almost every time. And I de indeed, I love how great thou art. We sang it at Mass only just recently, and I gave it out with great gusto, but I can't sing verse 3. I wander through glades in verse 1, and I shout with acclamation in verse 5, but verse 3 says... And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. Well, I can't, I 
can scarce take it in too because I don't believe that sort of theology. I like the Jesuits, they make it plain, right? It comes in at a very particular moment in Catholic theology called the atonement theory. Hmm. From the 11th century, and it is based on Paul's letter to the Romans. So it's got some New Testament roots. It's interesting that he says it comes from Catholic theology and not from Protestant theology. Uh, so, it, you know, Paul is in there, but you know what? Let's forget about Paul. But when you unpack those parts in the New Testament, they are used in a very particular way that I think have lost their meaning now about buying back slaves and the whole process of redemption, and then it gets picked up about atonement, and then the Protestant reformers really perfect it in what it's called satisfaction theology. That's the only way for God to get happy with the world, was the perfect son to make the perfect sacrifice so God's anger would be satisfied. There is another way that you can get into what Jesus, why Jesus, Jesus died, and that is why was Jesus killed? And that's interesting, you see. Did he die because he laid down his life, or was he murdered? Well, and I say in the book that maybe it's just more helpful now to say that Jesus didn't come primarily to die, he came to live. And the fact that he died is incidental. As a result of the way he lived, he threatened the religious, political, and social leaders of his day so much, they put him to death. And that God's response to Good Friday was not to see his only beloved son crucified in a capital punishment death, but was in fact then to raise him from the dead. So God's response to Good Friday is Easter Sunday, which is, in fact, the cornerstone of Christian theology. It's a rather nice argument. So I love how great thou art. I just shut up when it gets to verse 3. I know it's a very venerable piece of theology, but, for instance, the Orthodox Christians, they have not attended to go down this atonement, satisfaction way. They tend to be much stronger about what I've just outlined, that Jesus came to live. You see, when Christians go to Holy Week, to Good Friday, I think we ask the wrong question. We ask, why did Jesus die? I think it's the wrong question. I think the question is, why was Jesus killed? And that completely changes Holy Week. Okay. So Roman Catholicism, just like Islam, denies the atonement. It wasn't necessary for your salvation. This blood sacrifice this wrath of God, this justice of God, had nothing to do with it. Then, excuse me, how did Jesus then save you? Remember that we read in that statement, on the joint statement on justification, that it was through the good works of Jesus. But then they add in their catechism, not only the good works of Jesus, you can add the good works of Mary, and you can add the good works of the saints. So, you know, Jesus is there. Yes, he's pristine and wonderful, but you can get by without him if you have the others. And now we have a serious impasse, because now it's no longer Christianity. It's another religion, a totally different religion. And we have to make sure that we understand this. Colossians 1, verse 14. In whom we have redemption, what's it say there? Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. It doesn't say, in whom we have redemption through his good works or those of the saints. It says, through his blood. Colossians 1.20, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. How? In the body of his flesh through death. 
to prevent, present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sights. Well, the Jesuit did admit it did have some New Testament roots, but let's ignore those. Hebrews 9, 22, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Question, was the death of Jesus essential for salvation, yes or no? Yes. yes. Yes, absolutely. So can Protestants and Catholics unite on the gospel? That's my next question. That's like Islam and Christianity joining up in what they call today Islam. Now, please don't misunderstand me again. I'm not here knocking other religions. All I'm doing is defending what the Bible says. And you have a total freedom of choice to say, I reject it, I want to be uh, whatever you want to be. That's your choice. But if these things aren't pointed out, then how can you make a decision? Isn't it fascinating that all the religious books out there deal with how you should live in order to satisfy God? But the Bible has dimensions in it which are just mind-boggling. Not only do they have salvational information in the Bible, there's prophetic information which is so accurate that it knocks the carpet out from under your feet. So there's a prophetic angle. When God says, see, I tell you ahead of time so that when it does happen, you will believe. Then there is the historic angle which some of the other writings get totally confused about. But the Bible is every time vindicated by the spade of the archaeologists. So there's so much more to add emphasis and weight to what the scriptures have to say. So essential is the blood. This is what the Lutheran confession had to say. In our confession we read, the gospel, however, is that doctrine which teaches what a man should believe in order to obtain the forgiveness of sins from God. Since man has failed to keep the law of God, careful, take note what Lutheran doctrine says. So it astounds me that Lutherans could actually sign a joint declaration or decide to bury the hatchet in October 2017. All right, since man has failed to keep the law of God and has transgressed it, his corrupted nature, thoughts, words, deeds, war against the law, and he is therefore subject to the wrath of God. Is that biblical? Absolutely. To death, to temporal miseries, and to punishment of hellfire. The content of the gospel is this, that the Son of God, Christ our Lord himself assumed and bore the curse of the law. What was the curse of the law? Death. He bore it. So justice was satisfied and expiated and paid for all our sins that through him alone we re-enter the good graces of God, obtain forgiveness of sins through faith, are freed from death and all the punishments of sin and are saved eternally. That's what their confession says. So do they bring it into harmony with God's law? The law was broken. Now there are two ways of dealing with this. Okay, so now there are transgressors that have broken the law and the penalty for that is death. Justice demands the death. Well, if you don't want justice to take place, but mercy to prevail, then how do you just cancel the debt without canceling justice? One way is get rid of the law. Because the Bible says where there is no law, there is no transgression. Well, that would solve the problem. Get rid of the law. And then you're no longer a transgressor because where there is no law, there's no transgression. Okay. 
Did God choose that route? No, he decided to let justice prevail. He died. Therefore, it must mean that the law stands. Although modern uh, concepts sometimes say that that means that the law is gone. Well, if the law is gone, then there's no point for him to have paid the price. Let's go a little bit further. This statement may well be considered one of the most important and formative statements in our Lutheran confession. Why? Because it is the most complete and beautiful definition of the gospel to be found in them. When Melanchthon speaks out so strongly and at such length against the legalism and work righteousness of the Roman church of his day, it is only because the gospel, that is the promise that sins are forgiven freely for Christ's sake, must be retained in the church. And when he insists so vehemently that a sinner is justified by the faith in Christ, it is because to deny or undermine this great fact completely destroys the gospel. All right, I can go along with that. Now, Martin Luther. Tell me, Martin Luther, how do you see this thing of atonement, law, transgression, justice, mercy? How did you understand it? Let's ask him. Martin Luther, in the small cult article, structures all of Christian doctrine around the simple doctrine of the gospel, the doctrine of Christ and faith in him. Here is what he says. The first and chief article is this, that Jesus Christ, our God and Lord, was put to death for our trespasses and raised again for our justification. He alone is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Inasmuch as this must be believed and cannot be obtained or apprehended by any work, law, or merit, it is clear and certain that such faith alone justifies us. For we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, he quotes the Romans, and again he himself is righteous and that he justifies him who has faith in Jesus. And he quotes Romans. Nothing in this article can be given up or compromised, even if heaven and earth and the things temporal should be destroyed. On this article rests all that we teach and practice against the Pope, the devil, and the world. Therefore, we must be quite certain and have no doubt about it. Here is another writer, and this person writes, God so loved the world, another Protestant view, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. These words show us why God's wrath descended on his only begotten Son. Why the innocent suffered for the guilty. Why the just bore the punishment wholly due to the unjust. Jesus came to bear the penalty of man's transgression, to uphold and vindicate the immutability of the law of God and the rectitude of his government. He came to make an end of sin and to bring everlasting righteousness. So it's associated with the law. Here's another quote. The Son of God, undertaking to become the Redeemer of the race, placed Adam in a new relation to his Creator. He was still fallen, but had a door of hope that was opened to him. The wrath of God still hung over Adam. But the execution of the sentence of death was delayed and the indignation of God was restrained because Christ had entered upon the work of becoming man's redeemer. Christ was to take the wrath of God which in justice should fall upon man. He became a refuge for man. And although man was indeed a criminal deserting of the wrath of God, Yet he could by faith in Christ run into the refuge provided and be safe. In the midst of death there was life if man chose to accept it. So you have this link with the law. Romans 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son and has everlasting life, and he believeth not the Son, has, will not see life. So here you have believe, or not believe. So everything depends on faith. And uh, this is what these words mean, to believe or to not believe. Pistuyo or apateo, not to believe. So it hinges on faith. 
So this is basically the cornerstone of all Christian doctrine. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That's me. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, man some would even dare to die. But God commandeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Vicarious death. No matter how many religions deny it, no matter how many factions of Christianity deny it, it's biblical. Much more than being justified by his blood, which is essential, we shall be saved from wrath through him. That wrath belongs to me, now it fell on him. It's biblical. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled by God, by the death of his son, can the Bible be more explicit on this point? No. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we'll also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. This is the heart of the gospel. So let's not try and unpack it and try and understand what the real issue is. Because when we understand it, then we shouldn't be blown away by every wind of doctrine. The wind of doctrine that Christ did not have to die for you. Or, as the other religions say, it was an illusion, it never happened. Totally unnecessary. Or the doctrine that uh, it proves that the law has been removed. So where did sin come from? is the question we have to ask. Why was man created? Why are we here? Is this just some terrible experiment that went wrong? Why a mediator? What is atonement? What is the purpose of the atonement? Why have such a complicated plan of salvation? Well, it's complicated, but it's sublime because it answers all the questions and satisfies all legal requirements. There is no other way in which this could have been solved. It's an horrendous way, but it's the only way. So let's have a look at the mystery of iniquity. The Bible talks about Satan, Lucifer, and he says, you were perfect in thy ways, from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. Did God create Lucifer to fall? No, he created him perfect. But perfection requires freedom of choice. Because love that is programmed is meaningless. Only love that comes from free will offering is of any value whatsoever. So perfection required freedom of choice. Is there a risk in that? Absolutely. If you have fallen in love over your ears and you decide to spend your entire life with this other individual, is there an element of risk in that, yes or no? Absolutely. What if that other party that has knocked your socks off, decides that Mr. Buckteeth is much better than you. Uh, if she has a freedom of choice, or he, then love demands what? That you let that person exercise that choice. Otherwise you become a tyrant. And this proves that God could not be a tyrant because otherwise he would have created you without the capacity to do a stupid thing like Lucifer did. So jealousy got into his heart because he had a built-in capacity to develop it even though he wasn't designed to develop it. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit upon the mount of congregation in the sides of the north, I want to sit on God's throne. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. He knew the character of God. He had lived with it. He had experienced it. He had no excuse. 
That's why there's no atonement for him. But we have an excuse. And so a war broke out in heaven, and he was cast out. And he accused God and said, excuse me, you say you're a God of mercy? Look at you, you're throwing me out and you put the death penalty over my head, and there is no arbitrator between us. It's you and me. And the angels that sided with me, and the angels that sided with you, and we have a conflict. And there is no neutral party that can decide who is right. Are you going to be a tyrant and say, sizzle fits, I wipe you out? Then you just prove my point. You're nothing but a tyrant. And so God, in his wisdom, created a jury and said, okay, we'll create a party that knows nothing about me and knows nothing about you and I will explain my case and you can explain your case and they can judge. Will judgment be handed to the people of God, yes or no? Absolutely. Will you not judge angels? Does the Bible say so? Which angels? Fallen angels, of course. So you're a jury. You were created to be a jury. And you were created in the image of God, which meant that you had freedom of choice. He didn't create you to fall, but he knew that if you made the wrong choice, you would fall. But even in that state, he, being the originator, having you corporately in him, could step in, and then people could still make that choice as to which party was right in this issue. Fascinating. Opposed to that, you have the mystery of godliness. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Who? God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the spirit. Seen of angels. Preached unto Gentiles. Believed on in the world. Received up into glory. Here was hum humankind. And they had conditional immortality. But if they chose the wrong path, they would lose that immortality and become mortal. And so Jesus decided to take on human flesh so that in his humanity, being fully God, he could die. In his divinity, he could not die. But as a human being, being a divine human being, he could die and satisfy the demands of justice. So, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery amongst the Gentile, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Isaiah tells us who this Savior would be. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Excuse me. What are they calling Jesus here? The everlasting Father. He and, and the Father are one. This is a divine decision. So Roman Catholicism that teaches that the one party is being wrathful by pouring his wrath out on his son and crushing him is a false theology. You see, they say, you are saved by his good works. Now let me unpack that to you in a simple way. So they state that a greater sacrifice and gift has been given God than that which offended in the other party, therefore God forgave the other party. Now does that make any sense? You have two children. The one is a very obedient little boy, and the other one is a very vindictive little fellow. And you go away, and the angry one takes his baseball bat and in a fit of rage smashes his father's computer, goes to his father's favorite car parked in the garage, and smashes the windscreen, puts 10,000 dents into the bonnet in a fit of rage, and smashes out all the lights. 
The other one cuts the lawn, does the dishes, prepares everything beautifully, picks a little bunch of flowers to make his mother happy when they come home. And the parents walk in and see the chaos, but they see that the good boy has done all of these marvelous things. And they say to the wicked one, because your brother was so good, you're forgiven. Does it work? It just doesn't make any sense, but this is what theology is. It's amazing. So he's called Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He had two natures, the nature of man and the nature of God. In him, divinity and humanity were combined. And upon his meditorial work hangs the hope of the perishing world. Only God could do it. It is indeed a mystery how purity and harmony and joy could give way to iniquity resulting in disharmony, pain, suffering, and death. Because a criminal can't forgive himself. I can't say I forgive myself. Somebody else has to be for forgive you. It must be a lawgiver or the administrator. The one who gave the law, who made the law, or represents the law, is the only one who can forgive. Now, look at what Job says. This is fascinating. Job 9. For he's not a man as I am that I should answer him, talking about God. And we should come together in judgment. Neither is there a day's man betwixt us. Now, day's man is an old English word for a mediator. He's sitting in his misery and he's talking about God and say, Here's, who's one who will take my side in this? Who will mediate between me and God? He said, neither is there any daysman betwixt us that may lay his hands upon us both. Let him take his rod away from me and let not his fear terrify me. Then would I speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. I need a mediator. Where's the daysman? And then the answer comes. Job 33, 24. And then he is gracious unto him and said, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. Isn't that beautiful? I wonder whether Jesus threw that one in on the way to Emmaus. Wesley comments, I love these reformers. And this is a method of speaking. He, God, a ransom, although I might justly destroy him, yet I will spare him, for I have found out a way of ransoming sinners from death, which is the death of my son, the redeemer of the world, and with respect to which I will pardon them that repent and sue for mercy or ask for mercy. Observe how God glorifies in the invention. I have found, I have found a ransom a ransom for poor undone sinners. I, even I, am he that has done it. Beautifully grabs the gospel here. Matthew 20, 28, Even so the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many, says Matthew and Mark. This is the heart of the gospel. If we deny it, we un don't understand it. Ephesians 3, 9, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hitting God who created all things by Jesus Christ. He is the creator to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are we doing the job that has been assigned to us to make this known to the world? Or are we capitulating to false doctrines? If we look at the, the history of the church throughout the ages, from the time of Adam, you had three periods, three dispensations. You had the patriarchal dispensation, then you had the Levitical dispensation, and then you had the Christian dispensation. The first two served as types, shadows, to explain 
the last one, the Christian dispensation. So the first ended with the birth of Israel as a nation, then the patriarchal system came to an end. The second ended when the curtain was rent from top to bottom and the sacrificial system came to an end because it had been fulfilled in Christ. And uh, the next one will end when Christ returns. So let's look at these three dispensations. John 3, 16 said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And the patriarchs represented in type Jesus. So they were the mediators. Now, of course, as a mediator, if they wanted to mediate for sin, rightfully they should die and pay the penalty for the sin. But God gave a way out. And he pointed to the great mediator by giving them a sacrificial animal and say, let this die and let this one point to the great sacrifice that will come in the future. And so they sacrificed animals. Only once did God require that the son should be sacrificed, contrary to everything God had ever said. So this is an enactment of the gospel to show that Abraham believed God and this was accredited to him for righteousness. He didn't have to go through with it, but it was a type of the great sacrifice that was to come. Though he were a son, says Hebrews, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Obedience is always part of the equation. Called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now that is interesting because later God inst instituted the Levitical system through the sons of Levi. But Jesus was not a Levite. That's why they couldn't accept him he was from the tribe of Judah. But here is a way out. This strange Melchizedek gave the solution. God is so precise. The Bible is so unique. It's magnificent. Now listen to the sacrificial system that they had to perform. Neither shalt thou go up by the steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness not be discovered. So there were allowed to be no steps. Thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones, and thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord thy God. So it had to look something like this, or something like this. The stones were not allowed to be hewed. But of course the stone stands for character. And Christ's character is perfect. It needs no hewing and squaring. It had to be unhewed. Whereas we are to be built into the temple and need to be hewed and squared. That's why life is so painful. A people that provoke me to anger continually to my face, that sacrifice in gardens and burn incense on altars of brick. Here's an altar of brick that was used in pagan cultures, and this is forbidden by God, because God's character cannot be squared off. It's perfect. Don't touch it. Now this Melchizedek was king of Salem, and he brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. The bread and the wine. What did Jesus bring? Bread and wine. Okay, so the one stands for his body that would be rent for us, the other one for the blood that would be poured out on our behalf. For the Lord has sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So this is a special order which makes allowance for someone from the tribe of Judah to become the inheritor of the priestly ministry and the highest because even the patriarch was subject to Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, says Hebrews, king of Salem, priest of the most high God who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that king of Salem, which means king of peace, 
Without father, without mother, without descent, there's much debate about that scent. It means there's no record of his genealogy. He appears in the Bible. We don't know where he comes from. We don't know where he goes. We, we know nothing about him. And so Jesus had no genealogy that we know of other than the line through Mary, his father. There's no record of how that happened except by faith. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, we know nothing about that record. We don't know where he came from. We don't know where he's going. But in typology, Jesus is eternal. But made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So here is the typology. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoil. He came to meet Abraham's army. That's a type of all the redeemed. We are in the army of the Lord. He brought bread and wine, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. He blessed Abraham. So those who believe in Jesus are Abraham's seed according to the promise and can receive the blessing. He accepted Abraham's tithe. And so it is with the children of God today. For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness. And if you be Christ, then you be Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now isn't it strange that some people want to follow a literal genealogy rather than the spiritual? If you believe God's word, you are heirs and children of Abraham. And that is all that is required. Now, concerning the promise and the oath, Hebrews says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which is the anchor for our soul. And then he refers to made a high priest. Jesus was being made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. If Melchizedek wasn't in the Bible, we would have a problem with Jesus being a priest because he was not a Levite. God introduced even that into the scriptures. No human mind can think up these intricacies. Now Wesley has a nice comment on this verse and he says, by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in either, much more in both of which it was impossible for God to lie, we may have strong consolation, swallowing up all doubt and fear, who have fled after having been tossed by many storms to lay hold on the hope set before us, on Christ the object of our hope and glory, we hope through him. So there's the gospel in type in the patriarchal system. And when it comes to the Levitical system, God gives more detail. This must have been part of Jesus' story as well. The tabernacle service. The Bible says us, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Today, most people just brush the sanctuary aside as though it meant nothing. It had a very specific structure. There was this outer wall. There was one opening. There was the altar of burnt offering. There was the laver. Then there was a holy chamber and a most holy chamber. And it says the acquittal and deliverance are never based on own merit, always on the merit of the great high priest. So let's read the verses. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay it for a sin offering in the place where they killed the burnt offering. So the sinner comes and he lays his hand on his offering and he confesses his sins over the lamb. And then the lamb dies in its, pl in its place. And the priest shall take the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out the blood thereon at the bottom of the altar. So this lamb, sacrificial lamb, typified Jesus Christ who would come. And he shall take away all the fat thereof. And the fat of the lamb is taken away from the sacrifice of peace offering. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar 
according to the offering made with fire. And the Bible tells us this fat symbolizes sin. So the sin is in type expiated. It's burnt away. So this blood is life. Justification, sanctification is title and fitness for heaven. Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. This is what life is about. That's why Jesus poured out his life so that we could have life. But he being sinless and being God could lay down his life and take it up again. And I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for your soul. How can Catholicism say the blood was not necessary? In the sanctuary path, there's no partial forgiveness. Forgiveness is absolute as though you had never sinned. So you came in and you were covered, surrounded by this white linen wall. So when you come through this door, Jesus says, I am the door. You must enter in through this door. There's no other way to enter. You have to enter in by the door, which is Christ. Immediately you are confronted by the altar of burnt offering, which stands for the cross, the Lamb of God that died for my sins. And then there's the, the, the labor of washing, the washing away of your sins, your rebirth. Then there is the first chamber, with the altar of incense, the candlestick, and the table of the showbreads. The body of Jesus, his bread that was given to us, the unleavened, sinless Christ, the light of the world, the mediator. And then there was the holy place, where you had the Ark of the Covenant with its content. And the priest would come in after sacrificing for himself, and in type, having taken upon himself all the sins that had been confessed before him over the lamb by internalizing a small piece of the lamb and then sacrificing for himself, he brought the record of the sin into here. And this represents the prayers of the saints being made acceptable to God through the mediation of Christ. And then there was the Most Holy. And in the Most Holy, you had the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat. Now, it's interesting that the mercy seat was 1.5 cubits high, and the altar of burnt offering, the grill whereupon everything was burnt, was the same height. So the justice of God, the sacrifice, is as high as his mercy. This is the throne of God. This is where God sits. This is his seat of authority. Now we must understand this. The throne of God is upon his law, which is in tablets of stone. And here he sits, and the law condemns us to death, but the mercy seat shields us from the condemnation of the law. Fascinating. The hidden manna, the manna only lasted one day. Except on the Friday, it lasted two days so that they didn't have to collect it on the Sabbath day. And this, the Bible says, that Jesus would not see corruption and so the manna did not see corruption when it was on the seventh day. On the sixth day it fell for two days and saw no corruption. Types of his body. And a dead stick blossomed. So he had life within himself. These are the attributes of the high priest. And this is the seat of his authority, the law, and the seat of his government. And who coveted that seat? Satan. Satan. And he was thrown out of heaven because of it. What is the promise? He who overcomes, I will give to sit with me, not on my throne, in my throne, much more than on my throne. Anybody can take a glimpse and sit on the throne. Oops, hello. To sit in the throne means to be a partaker of the throne. Can you imagine that God is going to give redeemed humanity 
that which cost Satan heaven. Unbelievable. Now let's unpack this. For the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared a throne for judgment. Now it gets interesting. So God's throne has the cherubs on either side. It has the mercy seat. It's part of his character. His mercy is as high as his justice. The stone of authority, the law, is under his seat. His body, which is ever fresh and never fades in the ark, it never went bad there, the manna, is eternal. And he's the one that can bring life out of death. The message of the ark. So, Revelation 4, 23, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, the throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat on it to look upon, like, and then it gives all the glory of the stones of what it looked like. In contrast, here is an earthly throne, and this is a fascinating throne, because this is the throne upon which the kings and queens of England are enthroned. This is the throne chair. And there is a stone under the chair. Now, where does that stone come from? Yeah, the queen and the prince are sitting upon the throne. This is not the inauguration throne. This is another throne. But when they are crowned, they sit on the throne with a stone underneath it. And here the telegraph says us, the stone of destiny is fake, claims Alex Salmon. That's interesting. Uh, here it says, Scottish, England, and British monarchs have been crowned on the ancient coronation stone since the 9th century. It spent 700 years under the chair in Westminster Abbey after it was seized in 1296 by Edward I and was finally returned to Scotland 12 years ago. It has since been viewed at Edinburgh Castle by tens of thousands of people and is regarded as a symbol of Scottish independence. According to legend, Jacob used the ancient stone as a pillow when he dreamt of a ladder to heaven, but Scotland's first minister is convinced that it may be no more than a worthless lump of Perthshire sandstone. However be it, this is the stone upon which the monarchs are enthroned. Now, if you study British Israelitism, then British Israelitism claims that only the British people are the descendants of the children of Israel and that they have the rightful, that they are the rightful heirs to the throne of David, being direct descendants, as Prince Charles claims, to David. So this is the line of descent. And their authority rests on this authority, the stone, which apparently was the stone that Jacob rested his head on. I don't know why he should pick such a nice square stone in the river where he was resting, and why it should be Jeremiah that should have brought it to England for the seat of the kings and the queens. But nevertheless, there's a stone there. And uh, it is the seat of their authority over humanity because God gave that authority by divine right to the kings to rule over his people. So their authority rests in their origin from the so-called direct line from Israel. Very strange view. But this gives them their authority to rule over men. Then you come to Daniel 7.25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until time, time, and dividing of times. And all the reformers said that this referred to the papacy, who also sit on a throne and who also claim that their authority is the law, but it is a law that they have changed not God's law, their law. So you have God's immutable throne based on the Ten Commandments. You have a worldly throne based on a stone 
that supposedly transfers authority to the kings of Europe, and then you have this monarch who claims his authority rests upon a law that he changed and is now his law and no longer God's law. This is a very strange occurrence. So you have the kings of the world and you have this power that claims to wield the sword of the spirit and that the sword, the secular sword, is subject to the sword of the spirit. Psalm says, keep me as the apple of thy eye, hide me under the shadow of thy wing. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wing. He shall cover thee with his feathers. So this is where your salvation lies. And over it the ark of the covenant, says Hebrews, the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Again that word, Hilasterion, of which we cannot now speak particularly, says the text. So that's the same work as this propitiation. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is truth. Therefore, wherefore serveth the law? It was added because of tr transgression, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hands of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid if there had been a law given which could have given life. Verily righteousness would have been by the law, but the scriptures have concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So he says the law stands. We are all sinners, we are transgressors. This is the standard of his righteousness. God is just. The penalty has to be undertaken. God takes it upon himself, and therefore he can exercise his mercy. Justice is satisfied. Mercy is satisfied. The character of God is vindicated. The accusations of Satan are made null and void. It is a logical gospel. It makes sense. It's the only plan of salvation that makes any sense on this planet. Take any other religion. How are we in the mess that we are in? There's no real explanation and there's no real solution in other, except for saying, you didn't shape up in the beginning, shape up now. Other religions say, well, you didn't succeed now, perhaps you can come again. Perhaps you can do it again and cure your karma. And if you don't succeed, well, then you can come again and again and again and you'll get better and better. Why is the world getting worse and worse? Does it make any sense? So law and atonement go hand in hand. This Protestant writer says, those only who acknowledge the binding claim of the moral law can explain the nature of the atonement. This is very important. Christ came to mediate between God and man to make man one with God by bringing him into allegiance to his law. The law is immutable. It is his seat of authority. You can't change it. And therefore, it stands eternally. God dealt with it by taking the penalty upon himself. There was no power in the law to pardon its transgressor. Jesus alone could pay the sinner's debt. But the fact that Jesus had paid the indebtedness of the repentant sinner does not give him license to continue in transgression of the law, but he must henceforth live in obedience to that law. That's why Paul says, do we make void the law of God through faith? God forbid. We establish the law. The law stands. Now, here I want to read what Martin Luther said. He said, It is most surprising to me that anyone can claim that I reject the law of the Ten Commandments. You see, he taught righteousness by faith, justification by faith alone. And so his accusers and the Catholic prelates said, Ho, ho, so you're saying you don't have to be obedient, you don't have to do good works, you're an antinomian, you're against the law of God. You've gotten rid of the law of God. So he says, how could anyone even think this that I reject the law of Ten Commandments? 
since there is available in more than one edition my exposition of the Ten Commandments, furthermore are daily preached and practiced in our churches. When Isaiah declares that God has stricken him for the transgression of my people, tell me, my dear fellow, does the proclamation of Christ's suffering and of his being stricken for our sin imply that the law is cast away? What does this expression for the transgression of my people mean? Does it not mean because my people sinned against my law and did not keep my law? Or does anyone imagine that there can be sin where there is no law? Whoever abolishes the law must simultaneously abolish sin. If he permits sin to stand, he most certainly permits the law to stand. For according to Romans, where there is no law, there's no sin. And if there's no sin, then Christ is nothing. Why should he die if there were no sin or law for which he must die? It is apparent from this that the devil's purpose in this fanaticism is not to remove the law, but to remove Christ, the fulfiller of the law. My question, did Luther understand the atonement, yes or no? then why do they not understand it today? How can they say, where's the document? Let's sign that we become one. If there are two different views on the atonement, two different views on justification, how can you do it? How can the Methodists do it? How can they sign these same documents? I'm not accusing, I'm asking. Martin Luther has such beautiful words. He had such a, uh, he, was, he was feisty. He said, these two foxes, legalism and antinomianism, those who believe that they can be saved by keeping the law, and those that believe that the law is gone, we have both of them in the world today, alive and well, and living as superbly as they were in Martin Luther's days. He says, these two foxes are tied together by the tails, even though their heads look in opposite directions. While they outwardly profess to be great enemies, inwardly they think, teach, and defend one and the same thing against our one and only Savior, Christ, who alone is our righteousness. You see, if you're an antinomian, and you say, I have no law, well, then you soon realize that without law, you're going to have chaos, so you make your own law. And then you enforce your own law greater than you would have enforced God's law, and then you're no longer an antinomian, but a legalist. Luther likened man unto a drunken German peasant trying to ride a donkey home in the evening and keeps falling off either to the one side into the ditch of legalism or to the other side into the ditch of antinomianism. Beautiful. Wesley, now we've got Methodism. Did he understand it? Well, Wesley carefully guarded his own doctrine of Christian perfection from this peril. He considered antinomianism the worst of all heresies. Most strenuously and persistently did he teach that the profession of justification by faith should ever be tested by right conduct. He writes, I would not advise to preach the law without the gospel any more than the gospel without the law. Wrote Wesley referring to the so-called gospel preaching, which is, he disowned. Undoubtedly, both should be preached in their turn. Yea, both at once, or both in one. And he sums up Christian ethics taught by himself and John Nelson in these words. God loves you, therefore love and obey him. Christ died for you, therefore die to sin. Christ is risen, therefore rise in the image of God. Christ liveth evermore, therefore live to God till you live with him in glory. So we preached, so we believed. This is the spiritual way, the Methodist way, the true way. God grant we may never turn therein to the right hand or to the left. How can you sign a joint declaration with two views on justification, two views on atonement? It appears, if I'm not mistaken, writes Fletcher in his first of his famous checks, that we stand now as much in need of a reformation from antinomianism as our ancestors did of a reformation from popery. 
People, it seems, may now be in Christ without being new creatures and new creatures without casting old things away. They may be God's children without God's image. This was Fletcher's main reason for the publication of the five pamphlets in which he defended the chief points of Methodist belief with a matchless logic and finest literary expression. Remember Tony Palmer? He says Protestantism had no fruits because there were no works. That's nonsense. Protestantism gave new life to the world. It opened up a new and marvelous way. Spurgeon said the same thing. He said, in my first pastorate, I often had to battle with antinomians. This is people who held that because they believed themselves to be elect, they might live as they liked. From my very soul, I detest everything that in the least savors of antinomianism which leads people to prate about being secure in Christ while they are living in sin. We cannot be saved by our good works, neither can we be saved without good works. Christ never will save any of his people in their sins. He saves people from their sins. Protestants always understood it. What's their problem? Why don't they understand it anymore? The source says no man can look within himself and find anything in his character that will recommend him to God. Or make his acceptance sure it is only through Jesus, whom the Father gave for life of the world, that the sinner may find access to God. Jesus alone is our Redeemer, our Advocate, our Mediator. In him is our only hope for pardon, peace, and righteousness. It is by virtue of the blood of Christ that the sin-stricken soul can be restored to soundness. Christ is the fragrance, the holy incense, which makes your petition acceptable to the Father. And then you can say, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God. This is biblical. The beautiful book, Steps to Christ, says, there are two errors against which the children of God, particularly those who have just come to trust in his grace, especially need to God. The first already dwelt upon is that looking to their own works, trusting to anything they can do to bring themselves into harmony with God. He who is trying to become holy by his own work in keeping the law is in tempting an impossibility. Is that what Luther said? Yes, absolutely. All that man can do without Christ is polluted with selfishness and sin. It is the grace of Christ alone through faith that can make us holy. The opposite and no less dangerous er error is the belief in Christ releases men from keeping the law. That since by faith alone we become partakers of the grace of Christ, our works have nothing to do with our redemption. But notice here that obedience is not a mere outward compliance, but the service of love. Law and grace. Justice and mercy. Why did Jesus have to die? Why was his blood necessary? Because we were sinners, we were sentenced to death. Only death could satisfy justice. And then grace could be applied. There is no other logical way. When the principle of love is implanted in the heart, when man is renewed after the image of him that created him, the new covenant promise is fulfilled. I will put my laws into their hearts and into their minds will I write them. That is logical. That brings the whole Christian dispensation into perspective. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Why? Because the system of types and shadows had come to an end. And now Christ was the substance and you look to him for all the things that were enacted in this acted plan of salvation. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. That is the plan of salvation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. This is the gospel. 
that needs to be preached. We cannot compromise on this gospel because then you're compromising the plan of salvation. You're creating more than one plan of salvation. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto him, and that's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. It is crystal clear. Protestantism understood it in all its beauty and is now going to capitulate. So in the old covenant, you had good promises. But in the new covenant, Paul says we have better promises. Why? Because the old covenant dealt with an earthly church and an earthly nation under God and the new one with a heavenly church and a nation under God. And the old one had deliverance from Egypt, the new one has deliverance from sin. Earthly Canaan, heavenly Canaan. Earthly sanctuary, heavenly sanctuary. Earthly Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem. Earthly priests, heavenly priests. Mortality, immortality. Of course it's a better covenant. The old covenant is exactly the same as the new. It was only in types and shadows. It had to have its substance before it could become a better covenant. So we have a high priest of a better covenant. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a priest who is set at the right hand of the throne of majesty, a minister of the sanctuary which is in heaven and not down here on earth. For every priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. And this is important. Every priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Sacrifice. What was the sacrifice of Christ? His life. His body. He shed his blood. What was his gift? His perfect life. What does Catholicism say saves you? His perfect life. What does it leave out? His sacrifice. This is serious. Okay. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished, and uh, to make a tabernacle. For see, he said, you make it according to the pattern. It's the exact plan of salvation. So we have a more excellent ministry, better promises. This is what he's teaching. This is the fulfillment of all things. And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to far unto the Father but by me. Now there's a movement to join all religions together under one roof because we all serve the same God and there are many paths to God. And we'll deal with that in the next lectures because now it gets serious. The first two lectures were purely doctrinal, showing what is the plan of salvation? What is justification? What does the atonement mean? Why is it important that we understand it? So that we cannot be led astray by any wind of doctrine. It sounds very nice to unify everything, and then later to bring all the religious systems on board and say, you know what? You have Jesus, you be happy with him, we have another way. We'll do it this way, or that way, or the other way. If the plan of salvation could only be enacted the way it was because of man's transgression, then there's only one way to salvation. The God who paid the price. There's no other way. That's why it says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no other way. So though I might respect other people who have a different view, and I won't go onto the barricade to clobber them to pieces or drive over them with a motor vehicle because they don't have my view. I cannot give up this view if I understand the plan of salvation because there's no other way. Where shall I go? You are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. You are the one 
who has the plan of salvation summed up in yourself. There's no other way, Peter said. You are the son of the living God. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit of the traditions of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and powers. According to the scripture, there's no other way. I've made my choice. Your choice is your choice. It's up to you. But if you believe the scriptures, then I would ask you to think according to the scriptures and to follow the scriptures. May the Lord bless you as you contemplate these things. And tomorrow we'll go into more intricate details exactly as to what they are planning to sign on the 31st of October of this year and what the consequences biblically will be. I don't think you would want to miss it. Thank you for coming. Please come again and bring someone along. Let's fill this place. Thank you. Hi YouTube, I'm Walter Feit from Amazing Discoveries. If you'd like to learn more or you would like to subscribe, then click visit our webpage, donate, share, and we would like to hear from you.